Good morning guys, welcome back. Happy Sunday to everybody. Yesterday I posted a request for questions asking you to submit any questions you may have about plastic surgery. And today we'll be going through all the questions and answering them. My favorites are breast augmentations and facelifts. Those are my top two procedures. So this is a great question. We do talk about this a lot when we do our BBLs, fat injections. So uh, this is called fat embolism. It is what fat embolizes, flows and obstructs the blood flow to the lungs. When fat embolism happens, it is very serious, often very deadly complication. And for that reason, it's really, really important that the surgeon you're going to practice as safe BBL techniques. There was a study that came out of Mexico and Brazil that looked at Mexican and Brazilian plastic surgery experience and they found very high rate of deaths and they found that this was a problem. So this kind of raised alarm bells around the world and plastic surgeons and plastic surgery associations around the world sort of started looking into this. And so a lot of research has been done into this and what they found is that injury to the gluteal vein, superior and inferior gluteal vein, resulting in blood, um, in, in fat getting to the blood flow and causing this fat embolism. The American Society of Plastic Surgeons has done a lot of research, cadaveric dissections, trying to look at uh, the cause. They've, they've identified this problem. Dr. Del Vecchio in the States has done a lot of research into this. And Dr. Miami has formed the WAGS World Association of Gluteal Surgeons in an effort to make this from happening again. So WAGS is a, is, a, is a pretty much a worldwide organization where surgeons from around the world have joined. And we work together to educate ourselves, to share information, share the knowledge, share the experience, to minimize the risk of this ever happening again. And based on what we know now, uh, we've created what's called safe BBL. Injection with a rigid, large cannula that doesn't bend, not injecting the muscle, not injecting under the muscle, and aiming away from the danger zone. So knowing everything we know about the dangers of BBL and knowing how to avoid them, I personally feel very comfortable doing BBLs. I, I'm not scared of fat embolism. Of course, I'm always cognizant of it. I'm trying to avoid it. I stay away from the danger zone, but I'm not terrified of performing this procedure. And one last point, uh, the initial studies into mortality of BBLs showed a very high mortality, one in 3,000, which is crazy, crazy high. But a deeper look into it and some work done by Dr. Lavecchio sort of digging into the actual numbers showed that the numbers actually not that high. After BBL, I ask my patients not to sit for two weeks and you really don't feel like doing much for two weeks. So two weeks is a minimum, three weeks is ideal. And then the longer you don't sit, the better. So get yourself a BBL pillow or something to sit on so you don't put pressure on your butt. Uh, I show this when I do my BBLs. We keep going until the butt is tight. Now there's only so much that the butt skin can handle in terms of expansion at the time of surgery. Some people do round two, round three to keep expanding, expanding, but in round one, of one session, there's only so much the skin expand, can expand. Most patients want to have as much volume as possible. So when you watch our stories, you see we keep injecting the fat until the butt feels tight. So when you touch it, it's just really hard, it's not squishy, and the fat's coming out of the incisions. Like there's just no more fat that you can inject. So a skinny BBL is really just a BBL on someone who's very, very skinny. We do all the same things, but it's more about body contouring because the amount of fat we're able to get out is not too much. So it's not only about butt augmentation, it's about body sculpting. No. If you do front and back procedures at the same time, how will you sleep? because you will compromise one of these results. So I personally don't like doing front and back. I know some surgeons do. I personally prefer to separate them. It's better for the overall result. So fees for most surgical procedures are very simple. Our tummy tuck fee is pretty much the same for every patient unless there's some major issues we need to address, but otherwise it's pretty straightforward. Same thing for breast augmentation. Silicone breast augmentation is always the same. Saline breast augmentation, Liposuction is not like that. It is very, very variable. And I keep stressing this, people get confused by this. Liposuction fee depends on number of areas, the complexity of the area, whether you have to flip you back and forth, how fibrotic it is, if there's any issues with the person. So when you go and look at our fees page, we have sort of rough fees for a particular area. You've add them up if you have liposuction, but then it changes. If you have to flip you back and forth, if the area has fibrosis, if we have to add vaser or J plasma or, or do anything else to it, so in conclusion, a typical BBL can range from 12,000 to 20,000 to more, depending on your body, on how much lipo you need, how big you are, and what you're trying to achieve with the BBL. So there's a huge variability. It's yes, a BBL is liposuction and transfer of that fat into the butt. If you still have good amount of fat that can be liposuction and transferred. And remember, most people always, always overestimate how much fat they have. So it's best to see a plastic surgeon get assessed and see if they think they can do something for you. 
Fibrosis is a formation of fibrous tissue, which is scar tissue, which happens after every single surgery. Typically, people talk about fibrosis after liposuction because it's a wide area of you know, surgical area and you can get scarred through the whole area. So this happens with every surgery, every liposuction. Fibrosis is normal part of response to the body, but sometimes get more visible, more prominent than the other patients. Typically, people that are thinner have more aggressive liposuction, have less fat left behind to cover up the irregularities of fibrosis. Question about tummy tucks, that's a big topic by itself. And guys, head out to our website, torontosurgery.com, and read all about tummy tucks. You can read so much about them, too much I can cover in this little 15 second little clip. Tummy tuck is removal of excess abdominal skin and a necessary tightening of the abdominal muscles. Liposuction can be combined with a tummy tuck, but that's additional fees and it depends on which particular areas and how much liposuction is needed. Any excess tissue that we discard is either sent to pathology to be examined to assess to make sure there's nothing wrong with it or sent to biomedical waste. So there are special companies that deal with biomedical waste that they take it and incinerate it. So I just answered a question about the fees. In terms of age, there's no real age limit. As long as you're over 18, you can be any age you want, as long as you're overall healthy, have a healthy body, healthy mind, and have a specific need that plastic surgery can resolve. Exercise improves your muscle tone, strengthens your muscles, but doesn't necessarily move muscles back together. So when your muscles have separated, unfortunately, the only way to move them back together is through surgery. No, you don't need a particular distance. It's more about abdominal laxity. Sometimes we do muscle application for people with very minimal diastasis just to tighten things up. So it, it's, it's individual. Each person is a little bit different. Thank you, thank you. All the, all the special magic creams that I use. <laughs> um, in terms of my skin, by the way, I think my secret, I don't smoke, I don't do drugs, I'm not an alcoholic. And when I was young, I wasn't out sun tanning all day long. I was in the library studying, so I stay away from the sun. Smoking and sun, UV radiation, are two worst things you can do for your skin. They age you the most. So let me say it one more time. People often ask, you know, what are magic tricks for anti-aging all those treatments. The simplest, most effective anti-aging treatment out there ever is a sunscreen. No jokes. Smoking really ages your skin as well. And so do hard drugs. No joke. When I was a medical student, we admitted a patient who was a cocaine user for 30 years. And no joke, this is something I'll never forget. She was in her room with her mother, who was much, much older, and the patient looked older than her mother. Uh, we do post that stuff, and you actually can go to our breast augmentation page on our breast, uh, our, our website, the breast augmentation page. If you could just scroll to the bottom, I demonstrate a, a drop and fluff progress. As I mentioned previously, age is only a number. As long as you're in good health and have realistic expectations, then no, you're not too old to have breast lift and implants. Breast implants don't go into your breast. They go under your breast. So they go either under the breast tissue or under the muscle. Um, so we're not really cutting into your breast tissue unless you're doing a periareal approach. Thus, there should be zero impact on your breastfeeding. Now, realize that about 30% of women can't breastfeed no matter what. So if you get breast implants and can't breastfeed, yeah, it, it would not be logical to assume it's because of the breast implants. You may be just one of the people who just cannot breastfeed no matter what. Yes, absolutely. You do not need implants with a breast lift. A lot of breast lifts that you see in our stories and probably other places include implants, but the fact is you don't need implants to get a breast lift. You could just get a breast lift by itself. So fat transfer is used for fat transfer to the butt, to the breast, to the face. Breasts are a little bit unique because you can't really get what I would call great result with fat transfer to the breast. Half a cup size increase is a successful procedure. So for that reason, I reserve fat transfer to patients who absolutely do not want breast implants and are happy with just a very, very little slight augmentation enhancement of their breasts. And of course, who have fat to be transferred. Yes, absolutely. There is no real reason why you wouldn't be able to. Uh, having had one surgery doesn't doesn't mean you, you cannot have a surgery afterwards. People often ask, how long should I wait? Wait long enough so that the previous surgical area is well healed. The fee for breast augmentation is for the surgery itself. 
and it's based on the implant you choose. It's silicone or sealing or ideal implant. The size of the implant has no impact on the surgical fee. So whether you get a 200cc implant or 800cc implant, the fee is the same. Choose between silicone and sealing implants. Uh, it's a very personal decision. There is no one implant that is perfect for everybody. They all have pros and cons. Check out our website, go to the breast augmentation page and read the section of silicone versus saline to help educate yourself. The most common cause of implant rupture most likely is wear and tear. Implants kind of move, fold. Uh, it's, it's, it's a memory product, it's not perfect. So over time, the shell can weaken and can develop a little, little poke hole or leak. There's no need to go ahead and preventatively schedule uh, implant replacement, you just let them be. If there's a problem, then you do something about it. If there's no problem, no need. There's no need to go ahead and preventatively schedule uh, implant replacement, you just let them be. If there's a problem, then you do something about it. If there's no problem, no need. Check out our feed, it's actually one of the latest posts I posted. Now understand everybody heals differently. Some people get absolutely beautiful scars and some people unfortunately get what's called hypertrophic or keloid scars, which are very, very unsightly. The quality of the scars has to do with a patient's genes. Some people are just predisposed to abnormal scars no matter how hard you try. Meticulous closure by the surgeon and then after surgery, no trauma, no injury, no infection, nothing damaging the scar while it's healing. So your genes are a big factor, nothing we can do about it. I do my part in performing a very nice meticulous closure and then you need to do your part to make sure that you protect the scars so they heal nicely. Follow the post-op instructions your surgeon gives you. Ideal implant is an implant, ideal is a name. It's not necessarily ideal for everybody. Everybody's a little bit different. So there's no one implant that's perfect for everybody. That's why. We get this question many times for different kinds of procedures. If you have questions about our fees, please look at the link in our bio. It'll take you to our fees page, our fees and Canadian dollars, and do not include HST. So go take a look over there for any procedure questions or any, any fee questions. My dad was a plastic surgeon, so since the very early age, I kind of looked up to him as my role model, and that's how I got interested in plastic surgery and got where I am today. I did my undergraduate degree in molecular genetics, molecular biology at the University of Toronto, Medical School University of Toronto, plastic surgery at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, and then plastic reconstructive cancer reconstruction, microsurgery in New York Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer. I started my undergraduate degree in 1993 and finished my fellowship final last training in 2007. So you do the math. I love to operate. I, I, I tell people the OR is my playground. I love spending time in there. I love transforming people's bodies and seeing the results. I'm a very visual person. I like to see the results of my work. Read a lot, study a lot. Try to understand what you're doing, don't just memorize facts. There's no shortcut, there's no magical little formula, just a lot of hard work, a lot of hours, and a lot of sacrifice. So the pre-op protocol varies from place to place. In Ontario, we do not need to do pre-op tests unless they're indicated. So if I'm concerned about something, if you have previously medical conditions, or if I'm concerned about something during surgery, then we would send you for a blood test or some sort of test before. Be at your ideal weight. So if you're overweight, lose weight, be in a good physical condition, um, and follow your surgeon's pre-op instructions. So sometimes you have patients that just go have a surgery and they don't get tested. They're worried, well, I didn't get a test as it's normal. You guys doing, you know, practicing the medicine. Yes, we are. If you're over a healthy, healthy young lady, have no medical issues, no concerns, the surgery is simple, there's no need for blood work. After surgery, keep your wounds clean, dry, bacteria-like moisture. Don't put stress on them, don't stretch them, don't hurt them. And as you're healing, there's various things you can do for them. Uh, silicone, silicone tapes, creams, um, uh, probably the best for scar care. They're no magic, but they're most effective of all the different treatments out there. If you guys wanna understand more about the healing process, please go to our website. If you wanna see it, watch our stories on Thursdays, our follow-up days when we show the progress of people healing after surgery. Although now because of COVID, we limit things, so it's all virtual, so you don't get to see so much. So hopefully once COVID is over and we're able to go back to our regular process and see people in clinic for follow-ups, watch us on Thursdays, that's the follow-up day. That's where you get to see what happens after the surgery. BMI is an indicator, not a very good one, but as good as we have to indicate the risk of post-op complications and risks. Fat is much lighter 
than muscle. So someone who has a lot of fat will have a higher BMI, but someone who's got muscle will also have an increased BMI. That being said, however, we get people contacting us with high BMI claiming that it's really their muscle mass. Uh, some kind, sometimes it is, and we ask them for pictures, but most often it is not. It is, even if you think you have a lot of muscle, still. More often than not, when these people send us pictures, I see a lot of excess fat that is still present. And for that reason, we turn them away. We have a very strict BMI of 30 cutoff. You cannot even come for a consultation if your BMI is over 30. And then once you've had a consultation, we still ask you to lose weight before surgery. Um, if you don't, um, understand we cannot give you as good of a result as someone would get who's got a much lower BMI. And here's one point that's obvious to some, totally not obvious to others. Let me make it very, very clear. There is no amount of plastic surgery of tummy tucks or liposuction I can possibly do to make a BMI 30 person look like a BMI 20 person. Yes, you can do neck lipo after you've had a Kaipala treatment, even though it does create a little of scar tissue. Do I recommend Kaipala? Only in very, very mild cases, because remember, non-surgical treatments are still not a replacement for the real surgery. It's not gonna give you the same result. Uh, I find a lot of people get Kaipala, hoping that they can get a little bit of a result. They do it, they're not that happy, and they end up coming to us for neck liposuction. That being said, my experience is a little skewed because I only see people that are unhappy with the Kaipala coming to me, but I do see it a lot. So I don't, I don't see all the happy people at Kaipala treatments, but be ready for the fact that you may end up being not satisfied and wanting more. Okay, a few more questions. Um, the time ran out, so I won't have them up there. I'll just read them, I took a screenshot. Question about when am I, when am I coming to UAE? Hopefully soon I'll be coming to UAE and Kuwait uh, once all these travel restrictions are lifted because right now it's pretty much impossible. Uh, next question is how far out are we booking? So we're, we're booking far out. If you're looking for a big procedure like a BBL, we're booking to June, July. Uh, something small, we can squeeze you in earlier. Uh, you can always be on a standby list, uh, but if you want something, please let us know. Simple procedures like breast augmentation, we can pretty much squeeze you in maybe January, February. Um, it's, it's a one hour procedure which we can easily add at the end of a surgical day unless it's a super long day. And then when it comes to local procedures, we are much more flexible. So a procedure such as labiaplasty, which we do almost always under local, though it could be done in general if you request it or if it needs to be. Uh, those are little things that we, we always add at the end of a surgical day. Um, so that, that's, that's pretty flexible. There's a question about round two, is it necessary? Nothing is necessary. None of the procedures we perform are necessary medically. These are all elective procedures, meaning you choose to do them if you want them, but you don't ever need to do any of these procedures. A question about hybrid breast augmentation, when people put implants in and do fat transfer. I'm not a big fan of them. If you want to do fat transfer, I will do it at a later stage, not to complicate the procedure itself. Uh, and the reason why people do this is to try to cover up the implant in a skinny patient. The next question is about risk of uh, implant rupture caused by mammograms. So there always is a risk, and when you go for mammograms, they, you should tell them that you have implants. They'll probably get you to sign a consent about a potential risk, and they'll do a special type of mammogram called displacement views, where they kind of pinch your breast off the implant to put the actual breast tissue between the, the plates of the, of the mammogram and not squish the implant itself. So I think that's it for all the questions that you guys submitted. If I didn't, if I missed it, if I didn't answer your question, feel free to DM me, ask me again or perhaps uh, scroll back because I already answered it in one of the previous questions. Okay guys, so have a beautiful Sunday. I'm gonna uh, stop here. I'm gonna go enjoy this nice sunny day here in Toronto uh, while it's still sunny and spend some time with my girls. Enjoy the weekend. Take care.